Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we are going to talk about two graphic novels that technically wrap up the Agent Venom run. There is a short story that actually shows how the symbiote leaves Flash Thompson and goes into Lee Price or goes out onto the streets to eventually find Lee Price. There is a short story about that and I think it's uh, in Venom number 150. But we're not quite there yet chronologically, so we'll talk about that next season on the show for sure. But this is going to be my last Flash Thompson video for this season at least. And this is going to be the introduction of the Space Knight storyline and also like the origin of the Clintar race, uh, according to Brian Michael Bendis, who um, you guys pointed out to me that the name Clintar actually comes from these two books here. Uh, actually, before I left California, I found these two in like uh, $5 bins uh, at Golden Apple Comics. So I actually got the hard covers of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and 4. There is a Volume 5, but in that volume, Flash Thompson has already become Space Knight because of the events of this storyline. So we're going to dive into that and some theories and things like that uh, in this episode. But we'll talk more about Volume 5 and the rest of Bendis' run in you know next season. Because what I want to do is I just wanted to wrap up the Agent Venom stuff this season at the very least. So that's what we'll do here with these two graphic novels. And there's not a lot to say, although I probably am sure I'm going to talk for at least 30 minutes about this. Because every time I say, oh, there's not a lot to say about this. I end up talking for a long time. But the last like few issues of this volume are very focused on Venom and the origins kind of of the Clintar race and what uh, I guess they were always meant to be through the eyes of um, you know Brian Michael Bendis, who was never really a fan of symbiotes. I think he had said that a few times in interviews. That's why in the Ultimate Universe, Venom wasn't an alien symbiote from outer space. He was something that Peter Parker's father and Eddie Brock's father uh, worked on together as scientists and they created this uh, you know liquid skin that would basically go over you and hopefully cure you of ailments like cancer and things like that um, so that was like his approach to the symbiote was to do something like that in the ultimate universe but ever every time he wrote symbiotes in the main marvel universe he seemed to have some kind of disdain for them so i feel like this was him trying to be like you know what i'm going to add something to this lore of these of these characters of this this alien race that makes them interesting to me. But of course, I don't know, it, it's an interesting idea, I guess. Uh, you know, it's nice that he tried to put some thought into it considering around this time, especially, I never really, I really just didn't like his writing anymore at all. When he first kind of popped on the scene with some of his indie stuff and then going into Marvel with like, um, you know, his Jessica Jones storyline alias and uh, his Daredevil run um, and even the early issues of Ultimate Spider-Man, I thought were great stuff, like really great stuff. But then I saw that he pretty much just, once he once Ultimate Spider-Man became popular and his writing style in that became kind of recognized, he just repeats, rinse and repeat. And he makes every character now sound the same. And he gives, uh, the only thing he might change sometimes is motivation. But usually when he creates a new character now, it's like, it's like a character who's young and who has all the answers and who knows everything. And they're super smart and they can hack into, you know, Tony Stark's armor or they can hack into a Green Lantern ring or whatever, like... That's just, he has these tropes and he just keeps repeating them. So there's a lot of that in this run. That So I'm not a big fan of this. Like when I read it, I was like, eh, I, I appreciate him trying to do something with a character that he doesn't like. But I feel like still the stuff he doesn't like about the character still kind of shine through. Because I, around this time, Marvel had just, uh, they were like, there was some kind of behind the scenes battle with the term Space Knight. Uh, there was a character called Rom, R-O-M, uh, Rom the Space Knight. And it was a character that was owned by another company and then Marvel had it or Marvel had it first and then went to another company and was going back and forth. Then eventually like IDW was like, all right, we're going to get Rom back. And so we're going to have, you know, they even got a Marvel writer, Christos Gage, I think, to go write that series. And, uh, and so they were like, yeah, we got Rom back. But apparently the term Space Knight was something Marvel had like fought for and kept. And so Marvel was like, no, we want the term Space Knight. And we're like, and then in like a last ditch effort of like, okay, okay, we gotta use the term Space Knight. Which character can we slap it on? That's what this feels like. They just were like, hey, we can reinvent Venom uh, again, you know, after we made him Agent Venom, we can now reinvent him again and we can have Bendis do it. And Bendis is such a company yes man that he was like, yeah, what do you want me to do with Venom? Because I don't like the character. These are just my theories. This isn't actually what happened. But uh, but I feel like he's just like, yeah, what do you want me to do? And they were like, we need you to make him 
a space knight and we need to you know call him space knight um so that way we can keep this term around so i feel like they could have given that to any other character but since um those other characters were being used in movies already uh that marvel owned and disney owned they couldn't really do that so uh so it looks like they were like all right well then we're gonna somehow just come up with a lame story of how flash thompson joins the guardians of the galaxy uh iron man recruits him into the guardians of the galaxy or recommends that he joins the team um after working with uh peter quill on earth on like some mission so that's really where this book starts off it starts off uh, this collects um issues 14 through 17 of uh, of the guardians of the galaxy 2013 run but also it has the free comic book day issue uh which i had when this came out so i remember this this first issue it's drawn pretty well bendis has one of those things like uh, donny cates does where he teams up with really good artists, which is smart. You know, if you're a mediocre writer, I think teaming up with a good artist is great because that just makes your books way better, you know, in a lot of ways. So um, so it's smart to do that. Um, but this issue here is about uh, Tony Stark talking to Flash Thompson. The problem is, is all the dialogue is garbage because it's typical Benda stuff. Uh, Corporal Thompson, have you ever been off planet? Uh, off this planet, Mr. Stark? Yes, just a little do you want to be do i want to be off planet well all of my stuff is here it's just that kind of bullshit back and forth uh conversations people don't have bendis thinks people talk like this uh that's why he started that in ultimate spider-man and it kind of worked for a bunch of young kids because they were just like huh what huh what's going on like, i don't know what's going on you know and they explained that to me you know it kind of worked a little bit for that for to to add like a, a style of writing to that uh ultimate universe but when it started carrying over into all of his other books, and it still carries over into this day with Superman and stuff that he's written for DC, um, it's just bad. It's just really, really bad. Nobody really talks like this. Um, and so it was kind of a quirky thing for like his Ultimate Spider-Man book. Uh, but then it just it became the way he wrote after that uh, because it was uh, seemed popular because he started winning Eisner's and stuff for his writing. Um, so uh, so yeah, so he keeps that up, and it's just them narrating. The whole book and it's uh iron man going through and explaining who each member of the guardian of the galaxy is to flash thompson aka the audience because that's definitely what bendis is doing this was around the time the movie i guess was about to come out or came out and so he was like we gotta let's introduce this to the the comic book uh like, like to new people out there who want to know more about the guardians of the galaxy we have this free comic book day book we can introduce them to the team uh, explain who each character is and we'll come up with a character to add to the team like Venom. We can keep our Space Knight title because we're going to build towards that. Uh, so it just seemed like all the stars kind of aligned for everything corporate wise that Marvel wanted to do. And Bendis was like, I can do that. So Bendis took over, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy. Or he was already, I think, writing it and was like, all right, I'll take it in this new direction now that I have uh, Venom to play with. And, uh, and I can also add something to his lore to maybe make me like the character more. So, uh, so yeah, that's what he does. So he has Venom join the team and uh and you know there's some fun banter between you know him and the rest of the team um obviously between him and rocket it's probably some of the funnest stuff there but i also thought um flash thompson and uh um what's his name drax like i thought those two had they had kind of hit it off in a way that i was like ah so bendis you know still sometimes can bring in those good relationship stuff like as far as like people connecting or not connecting not like in a romantic way all the time i think he's pretty bad at writing um that kind of stuff but as far as just people having regular connections and like seeing um, each other's points of view on stuff, sometimes he's not bad at that. And sometimes he'll pair characters together that I'm like, hey, that actually kind of works. So Drax and Venom being paired was kind of fun. Um, but then also having Rocket Raccoon constantly be like, uh, you know, a jerk around Venom was kind of fun too. Uh, but they all knew like uh, Groot and some of the others and Drax in particular, he had met symbiotes before and he had said that so flash when he hears that it's like hey can you tell me about my kind like what do you know about symbiotes because i don't really know much about this suit and it's been drugged now for you know a year or so whatever in the comic timeline and he's like so i'm not really communicating with it so I'm, i appreciate that bendis added a little bit of that in there uh but i think that was also just him kind of also still being a little lazy like he could have added things in because towards the end of uh the, the the colin bun run that was around the time this was coming out he could have easily had Venom, uh, the symbiote, and uh, Flash talking, and you could have got some of this exposition from the suit itself. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't really write the symbiote uh, so much. Only just when Flash gets angry or he has to, like, you know, fight for his life, sometimes the symbiote will come out and take control. But uh, but that's it. You don't really get a lot of the symbiote's personality in this. And you know me, I'm not a big fan of that. I like knowing more about the symbiote. So in this book, 
uh, the first volume, uh, volume three here, which is called uh, Guarding Disassembled, this one didn't have a lot of that. But to give Venice a little credit, Original Sin, this one, uh, volume four, did have some of that. So we'll get there here in a second uh, because, again, there's not much to talk about. Basically, the team is like, all right, all right, Tony Stark, you got us a new member on our team, which why Tony Stark gets to have a say of who's in the Guardians of the Galaxy doesn't really matter. But then you see that Tony kind of has a backup plan. He's like, in case Venom loses his cool and he's not someone we can actually keep an eye on uh, or we can't trust, he gives Peter Quill a device. And he says, this will help separate the suit from the host, uh, Flash Thompson, in case the suit ever goes out of control. So I kind of like that. It, it's basically Tony Stark going like, all right, I got I to gotta kind of keep a leash on this creature, but I don't want to do it here on Earth because I have enough stuff I got to deal with. Um, so we're just going to send him out into space. And in the very first storyline, the uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy get uh, split up. I Groot here fighting some brood members and stuff, which is kind of cool. They all get split up and they're taken down by different people. Guardian from the Shi'ar Empire takes down uh, Drax. Um, Groot kind of gets left behind on a uh, deserted planet um, after he wipes out a bunch of, uh, of you know, different brood members. Um, the Scrolls kidnap Peter Quill and they start talking to him. Or they, I think they kidnap Venom. Yeah, they kidnap Venom. And, uh, and actually one of the scrolls tries to bond with the Venom symbiote, which I thought was pretty cool, but it doesn't like bonding with the scroll and it goes back to Flash Thompson. So that doesn't last for very long. Um, and then Captain Marvel shows up because I think they were doing a big push for her on a company level. And so Bendis is like, cool, I'll put her in my book. And so she's kind of part of the Peter Quill storyline who, when he's dealing with his father, which obviously that was something they were talking about in the movies, like, oh, who's Peter Quill's father? Obviously, I like the movie version way better with Ego, the Living Planet, uh, than just this uh, random a-hole <laughs> uh, who I don't really care about. Um, and Bendis didn't do a very good job writing that uh, relationship, I don't feel like. A little bit. I, sometimes I'm like, oh, that's pretty good dialogue. But then once he lets his dialogue get out of control, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm not really liking this too much. So, um, so the, you know, they, here's the symbiote bonding with the scrolls. And then, of course, it leaves the scroll and goes back to... Uh, Venom and he's like I warned you and now he's like in full Venom mode and he starts tearing apart some scrolls so right when he joins the team the team splits up they get spread out uh, Drax gets taken away and and Venom is trying to get back you know to help them and, and reunite the team over the course of the book the team reunites without Venom really being a part of it uh, but then at the end after they reunite uh, you actually see them going back to the planet they left Venom on that Drax you know got separated from him on and in that planet that's where Venom you know he went into a bar with Drax and the bartender knew what a symbiote was and he was like oh, I've never seen a symbiote on a human before and he's like wait you know what this is tell you know can you tell me because Drax won't tell me can you tell me about my race and or the, the race of this alien and the bartender's like no get out of my get out of my bar I don't like Clint, uh, you know Clintars here he doesn't say Clintars I think he's like I don't like your kind here or whatever so we still don't know the word Clintar yet um but, uh, but at the end, the, the Guardians have reformed now, and they go back to that planet uh, where that bar is to look for Flash to see if they can find him. And he's there, but he decides to hide in the crowd and kind of disappear and, uh, and try to get his own answers. And he's not willing to go back onto the team because he's starting to have some trust issues with the team and stuff. Um, and then the rest of the trade is just some short stories, one with Groot, where the entire story is told with the dialogue, I am Groot. <laughs> so that I kind of liked. <laughs> so it's just, you know, all these different Groot beings going like, I am Groot, I am Groot, I am Groot, you know, and it's like just different pitches and stuff. And you have this big splash page, which I really like. Um, but yeah, you get a short story there, and then you also get another short story um, by, I think this is the future Venom artist, uh, uh, Sandoval, I think is their name, um, who did the Lee Price storyline. And they do this story uh, with uh, the Guardians of the, the Future, the Guardians of the 3000 Guardians or whatever, with, uh, I think it's Vance Astro, and I can't remember some of the other characters' names, and he's got like a, a, a you know, Captain America shield. There's actually an old comic book, if I can, if I have the cover, I'll put the image right there. From Guardians of the Galaxy, where it shows this character um, being taken over, it looks like a, a sim. I don't know if it's that character, but it there it's a Guardians three thousand character being taken over, which by what looks like a symbiote. Um, but I think I flipped through that book and it wasn't really symbiote related. But I don't know. Sometimes you know, uh, Donny Cates might reference that, or Peter David might reference that in his you know Spider Man story he's doing right now, symbiote Spider Man with the the King in Black. Um, so there's, you know, there's that stuff too. Um, but I'll, I'll try to have that image. Hopefully it went up there. And then in the very back of this, 
they print an issue of Captain Marvel just so you can kind of get more of her perspective. It's like a book that came out around this time. And then they also reprint the first time Flash Thompson uh, got bonded with the symbiote, which was in Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 654.1, I believe was the issue. Um, so yeah, you get all that in there too. So it comes with some, it's, it's you know, not a, a thick read, you know, but I'm glad I only paid five bucks for it. Um, but uh, yeah, so Venom's in it quite a bit, but he doesn't really do much. He doesn't really contribute too much to the storyline. He's mainly just looking for answers. And then he spends the whole book trying to find the team, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy team who have been split up. Now they all get formed together, but when they come back to get them, he kind of is like, all right, I'm going to stay away from them for a bit. I'm going to try to go get some answers, and I don't know if I'll get them with that with the team because Drax wouldn't tell me and some other people wouldn't tell me. So he kind of goes off and does his own little side quest. So I was like, wow, Bendis worked really hard to get him on the team and then didn't really have him interact with the team that much in the first storyline. And then even more so in the second storyline because the second storyline is a Nova story because we don't know what happened to Richard Ryder if you've been reading this book when it came out, The Guardians of the Galaxy by Bendis, uh, there was a, a mystery about what happened to Richard Ryder and if Thanos was killed or not. Uh, turns out Thanos was not killed. He was kind of left for dead, but he did not die. And Richard Ryder was there um, who sacrificed his life to try to kill Thanos. But in the end, he ended up just teleporting them all safely back to Earth because if he wasted his last powers to kill just Thanos, then uh, Peter Quill would have been left for dead and died along with Drax. Um, so he, you know, Richard Ryder wanted to make sure his friends were saved, but in doing so, he had to also kind of save Thanos as well. Um, so that was kind of a cool story, but it ties into the original Sin story arc, and it doesn't really have anything to do with Venom. So half of this book here is just, uh, you know, this Ed McGuinness drawn story, which looks really good. I like Ed McGuinness's art. Um, and it's a story where Richard Ryder, Drax, and Peter Quill team up to try to kill Thanos and these like evil, uh, you know, they're fighting over the Cosmic Cube. And there's like this evil version of the Avengers, of course, from like a dark dimension. So uh, so once they take all that out and they, you know, you, you get some answers. Gamora finally learns that Thanos is still alive and Richard Ryder is gone and how he has been killed. And then now the team is regrouping. This is why they're looking for Venom. So now they're regrouping and the rest of the book is pretty much a Venom story. So we'll, we'll dive into it real quick. Um, I do like the artwork uh, and the rest of these issues. Um, they have, uh, who is it, the artist on it? I can't remember. Um, let me go back to the beginning here. The, we have uh, Valerio uh, Chiti, which is uh, in issue 20. Um, we have, uh, who else is there? Oh, yeah, Ed, so the Valerio is issue 20, but Ed McGinnis does most of the, most of these issues, I guess. So um, so I thought, I thought we had multiple artists. I think, uh, yeah, so this is, um, I think Valerio's artwork here. But it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's really good. I like the clean lines, very clean lines. I think the color job on this book is awesome. Like I said, Bendis teams up with good artists. On this one, you have um, Valerio Shiti and David Lopez, who does art in this issue, and then Ed McGinnis and Valerio Shiti on the first few issues in the, in the um, original Sin storyline. But in the ones after that, the ones we were just looking at, it's Valerio and David Lopez who do the artwork. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot of great people on this, uh, on this book, as far as like, uh, colors go. Um, we have, uh, Justin Ponzer, who's done a lot of great stuff. And actually Justin Ponzer is a talented artist in his own right. If you haven't checked out some of the edge of Spider-Man stuff, I think he had done something in there. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly, hopefully I am. Um, so the last half of this story now is Venom. It's about Venom. Now that, uh, Flash Thompson has broken away from the team and he's decided not to rejoin them. He goes back to that bar with the racist bartender who won't like, you know, let Clintar race in. And he's kind of in a new form. Like, look what's happening to him. He's transforming. And the reason for that is because he's so far out into space, uh, further than the symbiote has been in a long time, ever since it's been on Battleworld and then Battleworld was kind of near Earth. Um, so pretty much since we've known about the symbiotes uh, in comic book history, it's mainly been on Earth. I think uh, even on Planet of the Symbiotes, it might have went through the portal to go back to the the home world or whatever and then came back, you know, or something like that. But this book aims to kind of retcon that a little bit. Um, and by saying that the planet they go to in this book is the official home of the symbiotes and it's called the Clintar, like the planet Clintar. And the race is called Clintar. Um, that's kind of what this book introduces. Now, me, I thought they've been called Clintar for years, but that's because my brain is broken. <laughs> you know, obviously, like I, 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 when I remember things about Venom, 
And I look back on this show, we started this show three years ago. And since then, I've been saying the word Clintar. Um, I had no idea that it actually came from this book, which must mean I've read this book before because I knew that term before we even started the show. I, you know, I knew the term Clintar. So I must have read this book when it came out and I just can't remember reading it because when I was reading it again here, I was like, it felt like the first time. So this is one of those cases of my, my, my uh, memory just, you know, not being as good. Like some people are like, wow, you know so much about this stuff. I'm like, I cram like homework. I cram these stories into my head right before I record these videos uh, to make it seem like I know what I'm talking about. But I'm, that's why I always preface by saying, I'm just giving my opinion. And that's why I always ask, hey, if I miss something, let me know what I missed because I know that it's not all properly in here. Um, so this story, uh, speaking of not properly there, Flash in this suit are reacting because they're out in space, like I said, they're further than they've been in a long time, and they are lashing out. Uh, the suit is taking control. It's uh, Flash is not really able to be himself and in control of the suit, and the suit starts turning because the Guardians show up and find him, and he starts turning on them. And it's, it's pretty convenient how they find him. Like They're just like, oh, hey, look, there's Flash, because they obviously they're back on that planet looking for him, but he just happens to go back to that bar, um, which kind of makes sense a little bit. He's going to go back there and try to find answers. But the team just shows up and they're like, oh, look, we're here at the same time together. Uh, so a little bit of story convenience, but ultimately that's fine because I understand, you know, he's got a, you got a few paid, you know, only a few issues and a few pages per issue to kind of tell your story. So sometimes you got to do the convenience thing. I'm not a big fan of it. I like organic stuff, but there's a little bit, there's enough of an organic, like why they're both in that place. So it's like, it's fine. It's close enough for me. Um, but either way, the suit, uh, it's lashing out. It's not, you know, Flash not in control of it. And that's when it uh, leaves Flash because they use that weapon. So uh, Peter Quill grabs that thing Iron Man gave him in the first issue and throws it down and it separates the suit from Flash. But now the suit is out of control. It's irritated and it, it's hearing like all these voices, which reminds me a lot of what Noel, what the story of what Noel's going on right now. And so the suit goes and looks for another host and it bonds with a Groot here and it becomes a giant uh, plant creature symbiote. Uh, it says, I am Venom instead of I am Groot. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So then it's like for the whole issue, it's just bouncing around, going to different members. It tries to bond with uh, Rocket. I think Rocket, uh, you know, fights it off for a minute or two. And then eventually it uh, bonds with Rocket again and he becomes, you know, Venomized Rocket. Uh, so a lot of those Funko Pops that have come out recently, now they make a little bit more sense to me. Um, but then Captain Marvel shows up and she, you know, she's part of the story now too. And she's kind of, d d you know, def defaultly join the team but not really she's just kind of helping them out during this venom situation and meanwhile while she's doing this side mission that's going to tie in tie her into the venom stuff eventually she's learning that peter quill has now been elected as president of the galaxy uh so that's kind of funny i mean again i think sometimes bendis has some clever ideas uh and same with like donny cates like i think these guys have good ideas i mean they're clearly talented at, at what they do and that's why they keep getting work and they and their books sell um, because they appeal to a, a wider net of people sometimes. But for me, structurally and dialogue-wise, I think both of these guys suffer similarly. But I'm sure Donny Cates would be happy to hear that I think he's in the same league as Bendis because I'm sure he, you know, probably had, uh, likes Bendis' stuff. Um, so it makes sense, you know, like he's a younger guy than I am, Donny Cates. So he probably, like me, grew up reading Bendis' stuff. But I grew up criticizing Bendis' stuff. Um, as opposed to um, just loving it because he was the star writer of my time. I was just a couple of years above that like generation and stuff. Um, but of course, the symbiote, like I said, it's bouncing to other members. It does land on Drax at one point, and then it starts communicating with the team and telling it, look, I got to commandeer the ship. It knocks everyone out, all the teammates out. And as Drax, Venomized Drax, it flies the ship further out into space and we don't know where they're going until we have this moment where Flash is having this, he's having a flashback, actually. He's having a dream, a nightmare, where he's uh, fighting with Valkyrie and training with her, which is cool because that's happened. And so I, I got to give Bendis credit again for paying attention to other books' continuity and stuff. I like that he did that. But then he has a moment where the symbiote, like, uh, the dream ends with uh, the symbiote killing Valkyrie. And then he wakes up and he's like, what's going on? And that's when he realized, oh, the suit is upset. It's lashed out and uh, it's taken down the whole team. It didn't kill them. It just beat them all up, knocked them all unconscious. So then he goes and finds Venomized Drax and is like, what's going on? And that's when Venomized Drax says, we're home. I've brought us to our home. And so, you know, in some instances, like Cullen Bunn, when he went to the Planet X storyline with the crossover with the young X-Men and Venom, 
uh, Clintar was like a desert planet, and at least the, the part where the symbiote hunter landed, he landed in like a desert area. Um, then on Planet of the Symbiotes, there was like machines and stuff. But now uh, what Bendis is saying here is that that is like an offshoot planet and that there's been a lot of Clintar um, race uh, symbiotes that have um, broken off of their main mission. Their main mission being one of peace and, uh, and coexistence and trying to better themselves by bonding with hosts and bettering each other, which is something we've seen that they touched a little bit on and like animated stuff and things like that. I kind of like that setup. Because it means like the the symbiotes that were trying to invade Earth on Planet Symbiotes, and then some of the other ones that have gone rogue, uh, like and then ones like Carnage that are kind of a born in Earth atmosphere and they they act different and stuff and have different abilities. It kind of explains those as rogue agents of what the Clintar are trying to be. They're trying to be better, and I kind of like that because that to me defines Venom. Like he's a character who's constantly trying to be better. He he knows he looks like a monster and he you know he's vicious and uh, has a broken moral compass but he's trying to be better. So the fact that the Clintar are trying to be better at least in this according to Bendis I I I kind of dig it. I think that's fitting for the character of the symbiote and Eddie in general. They they are trying to be better. So I like that the 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 race of Clintar are also that too. Um but so we have, uh, you know, we're, they're on this plant. And there's like plant life there and there's all this cool stuff. And it, it looks very alien and amazing. Like I think uh, David Lopez has like killed it. Like the, the art in this is fantastic. And I, I thought they did a great job. Uh, the whole team coloring and inking and everything. Like this just looks really fun. So, I, you know, I want to at some level bash this book. Like I certainly can bash the dialogue and then some of the other stuff. But to dedicate these last few issues to explaining how Flash transform sorry for the car honk outside uh someone just got home from work i guess at like one in the morning um but you know flash is he's he's changing into this new character the space knight and bendis could have easily just done it in one issue and got it done with and had no real explanation and that's something bendis does sometimes i kind of like that he took a couple issues to do it now i still don't think all this is great stuff but i still kind of like that he took a few issues to do it and kind of introduce this concept where they go back to the home world and Flash is like, no, wait, like, because the team wants to just eviscerate the planet. They're like, no, let's get your symbiote back. Let's, uh, you know, bring it back to Earth. Tony Stark can figure out how to make it less crazy, maybe, or Reed Richards or someone can help. But let's get it back to Earth and let's get away from this planet because it's going to drive you crazy. And Flash says, no, the planet's trying to talk to me and it's trying to talk to me through the symbiote. And I just wasn't listening. Um, he's like, it was actually trying to communicate with me. And he goes, I think we're going to get some answers here. But the only way we're going to get answers is if we all agree to be um, bonded with by a symbiote and, or, or by the Clintar race. And, uh, and they were like, what we, why do we all have to do it? Like Quill's like, can I just stand back? And in case you guys turn evil, I can blast you all back to normal, uh, with this device that Iron Man gave me. And he's like, no, we have to, we have to trust them, the Clintar, and they'll trust us with knowledge. And so they all kind of, um, you know, bond, uh, at the end here, they all bond with a symbiote and they are shown because that, and that's the thing. I talk about that all the time. The symbiotes can transfer memories. Um, so that's how they speak. It's almost like telepathic. They, they bond with you and they put images in your head like, to, you know, te like a telepath would do. Um, and, uh, and they can show you things from their past lives. And that's what happens. Uh, that They get bonded with, everything goes black. And then it's like, we are, uh, we prefer to be called the Clintar. And this is our story. And they kind of go through and just tell you like, hey, we were a race that, try to be peaceful we come from dark beginnings or like they allude to something like we're like hey we had it was tough in the beginning for us i guess uh, so maybe that's why donny kate's decided to build on that to do the null thing um because that still kind of works it kind of fits into this a little bit um but then you have the symbiotes uh, like the different versions of them and the ones that have gone rogue and have gone out there and, and done different things and had different agendas uh the ones that obviously took over um the silver surfer planet uh or not silver surfer planet but the planet that silver surfer went to and wiped out uh back when uh, carnage member when he bonded in amazing spider-man we talked about that in early on in season two i think where carnage bonded with silver surfer and he saw uh, Silver Surfer's memories and and it you know it transferred its memories that were passed down to it you know from Venom and before Venom to Venom and stuff like that like Carnage was able to see this planet that the Clintar had taken over wiped out by Galactus um, and it was because Silver Surfer led Galactus to that planet and he was like oh this planet was taken over by 
parasites uh, and the original beings aren't here anymore. So I'm just going to I'm going to purge and save this planet by having Galactus eat it. Um, and that's why uh, Carnage and symbiotes in general are scared of Silver Surfer, apparently. Um, so they they don't really touch on that too much here, but I'm just trying to like connect some dots and stuff for you guys, uh, or at least from my mind, my perspective. Um, but, you know, it, I don't really like some of the explanation here. Some of this stuff is, is I don't know, it's, it's some retconny, some of it's convenient, uh, but it's basically Bendis trying to be like, all right, we need to, the race is, of Clintar is trying to be better, and we need to slap this Space Knight logo onto Venom now, so he's going to bond with the planet, see what they've done, see what they've been through. The planet doesn't tell him anything about Null, <laughs> so that's a de Null is definitely like you know obviously a, a, a recent addition, of course, you know seven years after this book came out or six years after this book came out went in 2019. Um, so obviously it's not going to do that. But I just uh, it's just funny sometimes when you go back and read these old books, you're like, well, this would have been a good time to mention a dark god that created all of you. Uh, but I guess Bendis kept it vague so that other writers can come in and add stuff later. Um, or Bendis just didn't care, <laughs> probably is what, what, what it was, uh, to, to go that far into an origin. Um, but he does, you know, go into the fact that the Clintar want to be better. And so that's what happened. So Flash, now that he's bonded with the planet, they've cleansed his symbiote, completely wiped away all the the year of drug abuse that it has taken by the government and the Avengers, you know, pumping them full of liquid and stuff, um, purging them from, I guess, any remnants of what the Hellmark might have left on him, even though the Hellmark went to, to uh, Mania. And it just kind of reset him. And now Flash and the symbiote can completely communicate with each other and talk to each other. And it's almost like a, uh, like a confession in a way. They, and that's what I kind of liked about it. Maybe you guys don't see it that way, but um that was probably the one thing i liked about this was it felt like confession uh you go in you tell your story your your sins the things you've done the fact that you want to try to be better and then you get you know blessed you get told to tell you know say five hell marys or whatever and two our fathers and you uh and you are kind of cleansed by a priest um to go off and be a new person you know every day you can start the next day to be a, a new and better person and I don't know, so I kind of got that. I don't know if that's what Bendis was going for. Maybe I'm reaching here, but I just kind of felt that a little bit. Like I was like, oh, okay, I can understand this from a Catholic level. Um, so now he's purged and, and uh, all of his evil is gone and he is full on a hero now and he's going to be a space knight. Um, so I liked it. It's a little trial. Uh, you know, sometimes you need that for your characters where there's a leap of faith. And normally that would be something you would give to Eddie Brock. But I like that they gave it to Flash. Flash is also a guy who has, you know, trouble uh you know with uh with trying to be better you know and he fighting alcoholism and all these other things and uh his anger in general and you know and stuff and i i like that that was a moment in here i still don't like some of the stuff leading up to that moment and i don't like some of the stuff after that moment um but at least in that moment there where he's purged and he's like now can be a new being and be free of what happened before um and st set a new path i kind of dig that so I'm, I'm curious to keep reading um, I don't remember reading any of the Space Knight stuff before, but it seems like I've read this before at some point uh, because I knew what Clintar was. And uh, but I thought that's always been a part of the the lore since Planet of the Symbiotes. But here, when I went back and flipped through Planet of the Symbiotes, the trade the other day, I saw that it's not. It's like they just called them the Symbiote race. Uh, they did not call them Clintar or anything. So shows what I know, right? <laughs> I'm still learning things even 600 episodes later from starting the show, which is good. You know, I never want to stop learning. So it's nice. And so I appreciate you guys pointing that out to me in the comments. And I'm kind of glad I read this. I Again, I, I'm not a big fan of the dialogue. Um, I, I certainly don't think Flash added much to this story overall until the last few issues of this, which kind of focused on him. But really it was like, there was a little bit of a focus on it. It was mainly just like, hey, how can we get some cool battles and get venomized versions of, you know, different Guardians characters? So it's like, okay, they did all that. And then the last issue is like, all right, now we got to tell the story of the Clintar race, according to Brian Michael Bendis. Um, so, and that's what they do. So I got to say, at least Flash contributed something to the story here and had some kind of growth in a way. And I'm curious to see what other more talented, hopefully, writers do with the Space Knight idea now because i think there's three more volumes or four more volumes of guardians i think there's like a volume five of this series and then they start a new series where they renumber the book again because that's what marvel does and there's a volumes one two and three and maybe four of that book and i think i own them all digitally so we'll definitely talk about them and and you know and review them and discuss them on the show but um but you know we'll, we'll get there so i think bendis did all those 
but there is also the Space Knight 12 issue series that was written by a different writer and it had a different artist on it. And I'm curious to see what that writer does with this concept because I've seen a lot of you guys speak kind of positively about that 12 issue run. And that's basically a run where Flash looking like, you know, Agent Ven or uh, Space Venom, Space Knight Venom, it's him out in space actually doing things out in space, not not on Earth. So, and then I think he comes back to Earth at the end of the run when they do the Civil War II storyline, which I've never read either. So, uh, so we'll get into all that, but we'll do it next season. But this is my last Flash Thompson video for this season, and I appreciate you guys, you know, making this journey with me. This whole season we went through the, the storyline of Agent Venom and Flash Thompson, and now we get to end with his transformation into Space Knight, and we'll get more into the detail of Space Knight next season on the show. And then after we get through Space Knight, which won't take us too long, because there's only a couple trades to do it in, so it only took a few episodes, then we'll probably go back in time and talk a little bit about Peter Parker's time as the Black Symbiote Spider-Man and get into that a little bit. Or I may save that for season six, because obviously that might be better to save now that Spider-Man and Venom and everything might all exist in the same universe. So we might get a black suited Tom Holland Spider-Man at some point, and that might be good to save the, the symbiote saga for Spider-Man for a later season which means we'll dive back into the Lee Price stuff and then get back to when Eddie Brock returns as Venom. Uh, so that'll be fun because we just did a whole season where Eddie Brock wasn't Venom and now the next season we can talk about him becoming Venom again and that'll lead us right into the second movie which will come out uh, next year um, at, You know, as of recording this because this is, we're still like a week away from the new year. So I appreciate you guys you know, being so patient with me, with me being sick and a lot of other things that have been going on and my work schedule. Like I literally been working like nine days in a row with double shifts a lot of those times, a couple of those times. And then I have more, another like 10 days coming up after my break on Christmas. So there's, there's a lot of stuff I'm going through <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna try my best to get through it all, but I appreciate you guys waiting so patiently for these videos and I hope you enjoyed this one. So if you did, let me know down below. If you agree with me, disagree with me, whatever it is, let me know down below overall didn't love this book to be honest with you but there was some things in there that i thought were pretty positive and i did like the artwork a lot so kudos to bendis uh, just like donny cates for teaming up with good artists uh, that make your books look at least better uh than the way they're at least to me written um but yeah i think donny cates to me is probably a better writer than bendis um on that level like his dialogue doesn't make me roll my eyes bendis's dialogue does <laughs> because everyone sounds the same Donnie Cates doesn't really have that. Uh, so I got to, so to give Donnie some credit, but Bendis' stuff, I just kind of roll my eyes. But that last issue, it, it was, there was enough in there where I was like, all right, I, I kind of dig this a little bit, um, but it didn't make me love the run overall. But I'm still curious to see what happens with Space Knight next, so we'll get into it next season. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Merry Christmas, Merry Venomous, you know, happy holidays, happy new year. Hopefully this video will go up at some point soon, and I hope you guys enjoy it when it does. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.